In the fall of 1962, bishops from around the globe gathered together in Rome to discuss the pressing issues of the church and the modern world. This unexpected council, which had come to be known as Vatican II, had been called by the beloved Pope John XXIII. He was a, a remarkable pope loved by those within the church and beyond the church. And that was the first time, I think, that uh, a Catholic leader of that stature would be so widely appreciated uh, by a global audience. Pope John had led the bishops into Vatican II, but it would be Pope Paul VI who would lead them to the Council's conclusion. Half a century later, the faithful come together again in Rome to celebrate the golden anniversary of the Council and continue the conversation. Cinquanta anni fa, in questo giorno, anch'io sono stato qui in piazza con lo sguardo verso questa finestra dove si è affacciato il buon Papa, il beato Papa Giovanni, e ha parlato a noi con parole indimenticabili, parole piene di poesia, di bontà, parole del cuore. Eravamo felici, direi, e pieni di entusiasmo. Il grande concilio ecumenico era inaugurato, eravamo sicuri che deve, doveva venire una nuova primavera della Chiesa, una nuova Pentecosti, con una nuova presenza forte della grazia liberatrice del Vangelo. He's very much a Pope today, Benedict XVI, who was shaped by the Council. And uh, I think he sees himself in line with Blessed John Paul II as trying to continue uh, the renewal that Vatican II inspired. The events that followed Vatican II reveal both a prophetic and providential nature in the teachings that emerged from the Council. How would this ecumenical summit alter the landscape for priests, consecrated, religious, and lay people? And how would the Council make Christ known in the diocese and parishes throughout the world? Join us as we meet with historians and theologians, eyewitnesses, and experts to investigate the meaning of Vatican II and uncover the event which would become a definitive landmark in the history of the modern Catholic Church. During the final session of the Council, the bishops of Vatican II set to work on a series of documents which would cover three major branches of the Church, the priesthood, religious life, and lay ministry. Presbyterorum Ordinis would consider the life and ministry of priests, emphasizing their pastoral roles and more clearly defining the purpose and service of the Church's hierarchy. Uh, Pope Benedict was one of the theological experts at the Council. He was a young, German theologian at the time, and he had become an official advisor to one of the cardinals from Germany, Cardinal Frings. He made a number of important contributions in the area of uh, the doctrine of revelation, the relationship between the Bible and tradition, but also uh, the understanding of the church, particularly its structure. The prior council, Vatican I, had spoke very clearly and strongly about papal authority, but never got around to really talking about the office of bishop. And so the Vatican II had to achieve something of a balanced understanding of church authority. Promoting collegiality, the Council Fathers would help reinforce a circle of communion shared by the Pope and bishops. They would also go on to describe the ministry of the priest, emphasizing his role of acting in persona Christi, or in the person of Christ. The primary role of priests is service to their flock, the people of their communities. They must prepare to proclaim the gospel, be educators of the faith, and administer the sacraments, especially the Eucharist. We're here at the Pontifical North American College on the Janiculum Hill, which overlooks the city and most especially is so close to the Vatican and uh, St. Peter's Basilica and the residence of the Holy Father. It's a place that has for many decades trained priests for service in the United States. Even now there are 
250 seminarians here preparing to uh, be formed into the priesthood. But this college played a very important role at the uh, Vatican Council. Senior, oh, nice to meet you. Oh, good to see you. Good Thank you. Oh, wonderful. And it's good so nice, nice to be back here. Good to be here. Lots of memories. I see so many familiar objects and the Firmament lobby itself. It's wonderful. Yeah, it mm. is. Nothing has changed. Not much, no. <laughs> Please. How many years have you been here? I spent nine years. I was on the seminarian for four years, and then I was on the faculty for five years. Oh, so wow. I put in a lot of time here. Yeah. That's great. Well, I just can't imagine how it was uh, when it started here, like listening to all the bishops that who come by and share their story, how they were just waiting to be announced, or another new document, or other changes. We're very blessed to be here now and really take in all that fruit. Something which is a great part of our experience here at the North American College is the opportunity to be here in Rome and uh, to be uh, a few, a few uh, yards away from the successor of St. Peter. The Pope is responsible as both the Bishop of the Diocese of Rome and the successor to Peter to shepherd the Church in his ministry. <laughs> I would stress the, uh, uh, the, the theme of, of uh, service. We, we're not here because uh, we're somewhat special. Uh, as priests, we're here because the Lord has chosen us to serve his people. My motto is pastores abovobis, I will give you shepherds. And I think uh, the, the idea of being in the midst of the people, uh, getting to know them, getting to be part of their families, uh, and responding to their every spiritual and pastoral need uh, is so very fulfilling. Really going out to the people, uh, engaging with the people, um, not being afraid, not being worried about anything, but really knowing who we are as an identity and then sharing that with those outside, uh, with the people of the church. Last year we had unlimited visits and, and we had a great experience with the bishops of the United States, which was excellent, but also uh, times of travel, just uh, traveling around to the different countries and getting to see the liturgy and just the effects of Vatican, Vatican II around the world and not just in the United States. Priests serve through a shared brotherhood, looking to the bishops, their elder brothers in Christ, for guidance. In turn, bishops are directly responsible for the sanctity of their priests and must take their role as shepherds seriously. They must know their sheep. Cardinals are bishops who play a special role in electing the future pope, but they also become pastors of the Diocese of Rome. When a cardinal is uh, announced, when he's appointed by the, the Holy Father, he's given uh, possession of a church in Rome that actually makes him uh, a parish priest of the Diocese of Rome. That makes him uh, immediately, uh, more immediately than a bishop, more immediately um, answerable to the Pope, to the Holy Father, so that he can be uh, a more uh, intimate, um, how do you say, uh, uh, collaborator with the Holy Father. Today was, I think, all about um, the connection of the church in, in New York to the church in Rome and the Universal Church. As happy as my 36 years of priesthood have been, and even though I was blessed with eight extraordinarily blessed years as a parish priest, I've never been a pastor. So now, even though it's honorary, I really feel, uh, feel satisfied that I can finally be a, a pastor. And you know, it's a beautiful thought when you think about it. Why do cardinals get an honorary parish? You know the reason, right? To protect that beautiful theology that the Bishop of Rome is elected by the pastors of Rome. So each cardinal becomes an honorary pastor of a parish in Rome. So that when the Pope dies, the Bishop of Rome, which I hope won't be for a long time, the, new, the pastors come together to elect a new bishop. It's kind of a classical poetic way to protect what that very definition of the uh, successor of St. Peter as the Bishop of Rome. This is a very vibrant parish. A lot of families, young families, children, 
And I think for them, uh, being not one of these great historic churches of Rome, but rather a, a, a regular parish church on the, in the suburbs and the outskirts of Rome, it's been a great joy for them to have such a kind of momentous occasion to celebrate uh, with and with somebody who is so joyful, who brings such uh, charism and, and, and electricity to the uh, to the event. We're really here with the, the people of Rome and uh, celebrating that unity. Just 15 minutes away from Our Lady of Guadalupe Parish is the Vatican's Aula of today, the Paul VI Audience Hall, where the Synod of Bishops is held every two or three years, which emerged as a direct result of Vatican II. The Synod helps to guide the pastoral ministry of the Church. The Synod of Bishops, these events where the Pope invites a kind of representative sampling of roughly 250 or so bishops from around the world to Rome for three weeks to talk about some topic. The new evangelization, which is the topic of the Synod of Bishops uh, meeting in Rome, uh, is a renewed effort to share the treasures of our faith uh, with others, uh, and in particular with those who uh, might have been baptized and yet for one reason or another have not continued the practice of their faith. Father Thomas Rosica is the English language media attaché at the 2012 Synod. His job is to serve as a bridge between the bishops and the press. The largest group of journalists that are here following the Synod are from the English-speaking world. And so I've got quite an interested group of people that are coming and sharing with them what the great, the big themes are, what's emerging from the Synod, the Synodal discussions. It's a great privilege to be upstairs and it's a great challenge to be downstairs and trying to unpack all of this. But it's a wonderful ecclesial experience. It's been a real blessing to be here. Pope Paul VI would promulgate Presbyterorum Ordinis, the decree on the ministry and life of priests, in 1965. He would also promulgate the Council's decree on the adaptation and renewal of religious life called Perfecte Caritatis, or Perfect Charity. Initially there was not going to be a document about religious uh, life or even a chapter in the Lumen Gentium, but many of the Council Fathers were members of religious congregations of men, and they, just, they said, no, this has to be there, because the uh, charisms of the religious uh, contribute significantly to the life of the church. Contrary to popular belief, Vatican II did not so much change the habits or traditional dress of religious sisters and brothers, as it did reinforce their way of life through a renewal of their original charism and foundation. Perfecte Caritatis also explains that any changes to religious orders should go through the Holy See or local ordinary, so as to preserve the particular gifts, beauty, and traditions of religious orders as the heart of the church. I think that men and women religious are a, a resource for the church, and more than that, they are the protagonists in the, uh, in the new evangelization insofar as being committed full-time uh, and lifelong to lifelong service in the church are capable of doing things together and, and mounting projects. Uh, religious can be, uh, are already, uh, committed and therefore they can be, their efforts can be directed uh, to the new evangelization. A rich expression of faith is central to religious life. Spirituality is something which is very, very important in the life of, of any Christian, but particularly in the life of, of those who are religious or clergy or in preparation for ministry. And uh, oftentimes we use scripture as a, a point of departure for prayer or uh, for devotion and uh, so to have an understanding of the background of, of scripture and maybe to understand how to interpret it a little bit more keenly really gives new life uh, to, to prayer and it makes uh, prayer very, very exciting. St. Peter's Square, Vatican City. It was here in 1962 that Pope John XXIII first convened the Second Vatican Council, drawing Catholic bishops from around the globe to discuss the relationship between the Church and the modern world. The evening following the first day of the Council, the faithful of Rome led a candlelight vigil, or Fia Colata, to the Holy Father's window to show their support. Pope John XXIII delivered here his famous discourse under the moon. Opening the Year of Faith, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI commemorates the 50th anniversary of Vatican II with a special Mass. 
As evening falls, the faithful gather yet again in candlelight, recalling the night they greeted the Bishop of Rome with their prayer and song. Anche oggi siamo felici, portiamo gioia nel nostro cuore, ma direi una gioia forse più sobria, una gioia umile. In questi 50 anni abbiamo imparato e esperito che il peccato originale esiste e si traduce sempre di nuovo in peccati personali che possono anche divenire strutture del peccato. Questa è una, sola, una parte delle esperienze fatte in questi 50 anni. Ma abbiamo anche avuto una nuova esperienza della presenza del Signore, della sua bontà, della sua forza. Il fuoco dello Spirito Santo, il fuoco di Cristo, non è un fuoco divoratore, distruttivo, è un fuoco silenzioso, è una piccola fiamma di bontà, di bontà e di verità che trasforma da luce e calore. Abbiamo visto il Signore non ci dimentica, anche oggi il suo modo umile, il Signore è presente e dà calore ai cuori, mostra vita, crea carismi di bontà e di carità che illuminano il mondo e sono per noi garanzia della bontà di Dio. Oso fare mie le parole indimenticabili di Papa Giovanni. Andate a casa, date un bacio ai bambini e dite che è del Papa. He did also hark, hearken back to that moment in 62 when he was there at the opening of the council and the great hope that he felt and, and where he ended the other night was by saying, despite all of the failures and despite all of the heartache and despite all of the ways we as a church have come up short uh, over the last 50 years, Fundamentally, he is still hopeful about the legacy that the Council left behind and where it's going to take us in the next 50, 100, 5,000 years. That's, to, that's a hopeful message. Down in Piazza San Pietro, the faithful gathered under the Pope's window include priests, religious and lay people, both young and old. The bishops of Vatican II would address the lay faithful in Apostolicum Actuositatem, their decree on the apostolic activity of the laity. This document would encourage lay Catholics to pursue their faith, to evangelize, and to seek unity through the Eucharist. Whether it be the searching of success, or worldly success, or searching of meaning of life, they are still searching for something. And I think that search is what we could use. Um, we all, you know, people say that I'm faithful, I mean, I'm spiritual. You know, that could mean a lot of things, you know. But we need to be faithful in the very example of Christ that we live by and who we are as Christian is from that foundation. This awakening often manifests itself as a response of the laity in various Catholic movements. We all know that these movements have, have flourished and they have been acknowledged, they have been embraced by the popes of the post Vatican II, Paul VI, John Paul II and now Pope Benedict even if there's no mention of them in the text of the Council. So that tells us one very important thing, is that Vatican II actually has a spirit. And many times, John Paul II and Pope Benedict, they have uh, called these new Catholic movements as a fruit of the, of the Council or an example of the interpretation of the spirit of the Council. Today we have uh, movements in the Church that um, really take inspiration from Vatican II, um, but whenever these new movements achieve a certain public expression, they must always make sure that they're acting in communion with the local Church, with the local Bishop. The movements can be of great utility for the Santa Chiesa, but they don't forget that the Church is La vera comunità ecclesiale non sono i movimenti, sono, è la parrocchia, è la diocesi, in cui i movimenti devono inserirsi come eh, soggetti eh, attivi, importanti, ma che non devono sostituirsi 
alla comunità della parrocchia o alla comunità della diocesi. Everybody needs to be ministered to, I certainly need to be ministered to, uh, and uh, everybody I encounter uh, needs to, uh, to have that contact with Uh, with Christ and with his church, with the community. Dialogue is, of course, is very important in any relationship. Communication is very important. And I think the best dialogue is bringing ourselves in, not so much by words, well, of course, words in, at the necessary time, at a fitting time. But really, when we personally find our own relationship with Christ, the joy and the love that we experience will automatically communicate to other people outside outside the church or inside the church. Through the Second Vatican Council, laymen and women were able to pursue theological degrees for the first time in Catholic history. Through their document, Gravissimum Educationis, the Council Fathers recognized the importance of Christian education. We are educating well. Are we forming disciples of Christ in our schools? And I think that is what is missing very often in the, in the, in the joy that should take place in living out our faith. We, uh, We're a very successful Catholic community in the United States, largely because of our Catholic education system. But the fact that there's such a lukewarm uh, understanding of the church and, and, and its teachings uh, is, is a matter of great concern. And I think once again, this year of the faith and re-evangelization should be taken, ser taken seriously by our pastors and by everyone in the church. The Holy Father said, everyone should be an evangelizer, not just those who lead the church or serve the church. I think religious congregations are going to be able to uh, start schools of evangelization and help to uh, bring people on board and, and train them, really educate them for how, how to profess your faith in public, how to explain and, and uh, without, with confidence to uh, engage the questions that, that uh, uh, beset people of our time. Today, Vatican II itself has become a fundamental element of Catholic formation. It really is at the foundation of our studies now. Uh, any class, every class that we take always refers back to Vatican II and it's been amazing. The Council also speaks of the Bible as the soul of theology and in my own teaching I try to uh, give a lot of exposure to the Bible. We do also, despite the Council, encounter young people who come with a tremendous amount of biblical illiteracy. And so the need to really make the Bible uh, something that they're familiar with. So really helping them to understand how uh, the message in Scripture, be it from the Old Testament or from the New Testament, particularly the Gospels, uh, what, what does Jesus' message mean in their daily life? For the sake of harmonious collaboration among ministries and structures throughout the Church, Blessed Pope John Paul II promulgated a new code of canon law in 1983. Bishop Juan Ignacio Arrieta of Spain is the secretary of the Pontifical Council for Legislative Texts and a priest of Opus Dei. Essendo la parte centrale della legge della Chiesa, eh, che si applica in cinque continenti, eh, essendo ispirata questa legge nel, nel Magistero del Concilio, e il Magistero della Chiesa di sempre, vivere, osservare le norme eh, e, vivere, e vivere la comunione. Vivere la comunione nei cinque continenti. È quello che abbiamo la fede, abbiamo anche il, la, eh, il regime, noi crediamo, la comunione significa credere nelle stesse cose, osservare seguire le stesse autorità e avere gli stessi sacramenti e questa autorità si manifesta anche attraverso una comune legislazione e vivere quella comunione, applicare questa legge è segno di comunione. And so the code of canon law in a sense is the fruit of the council. It's a development of putting our doctrines and our beliefs and our unity into a structure to give it visible visibility in the church. Christ's presence in the assembly is transmitted through the assembly itself, the proclamation of the word, the priest, and the sacrament of the Eucharist. What does the priest offer? He offers Jesus Christ, the body and blood uh, of our Lord Jesus Christ to the Father, but the people join themselves to that offering. We are in communion with one another, we are in communion with Christ, and it is that communion with Christ, that communion with one another, that leads us out, impels us forward, uh, and we're fed, we're led by, um, 
by scripture and tradition. We're uh, led by the magisterium of the church. We're given the gift of uh, Christ in the Eucharist and we're given that communion with one another. Most theologians today would agree that the documents of Vatican II have yet to be fully grasped. Sometimes some of the most important things in the Vatican II documents are not what the documents say, but what they decided not to say. What they considered saying in an early draft and then decided, no, no, we're not going to put it that way. Vatican II was about renewal and reform, and though the Council has often faced misinterpretation, the key to understanding lies in the integration of all of the documents. I sometimes speak of uh, cafeteria conciliarism, in which people can pick and choose who picks upon the liturgy document, who picks upon Gaudium et Spes, the document on the church in the modern world. But I think that the challenge to us all is to receive the, the, the Vatican Council at a deeper level and integrally. Now, obviously, we all have our preferences, our expertise, but it can't be at the uh, price of ignoring the other constitutions. The improvements, I, I think, that resulted from the, of the Council are unmistakable, and yet there are people in the Church that yearn for the past. I think what the Council did was move us from what I would call a quantitative approach you know, how many confessions, how many First Communions, how many, confirm, how many, and so on. How many ordinations. To, right, to a qualitative approach. In other words, what we were talking about earlier, relationships. But I, I also think there's a tendency for us to focus on the real visible elements of the change. So when we think about the liturgy, it's easy to focus on the altar being turned around and the priest facing the people, though interestingly, that actually develops after the council. Um, the liturgy being celebrated in the vernacular. The council certainly opened the door for that, but it expanded after the council. We, people will focus on those things. Uh, the work that still needs to be done, from my point of view, is not to deny those. those. Those were important changes and improvements that I think helped enhance the participation in the liturgy. But there's a deeper liturgical spirituality, for example, that we still have to unpack. I think one of the challenges we face as we approach the renewed reception of the Council at its 50th anniversary uh, is to highlight the mystery of the Church, and it's the mystery of God. And so, as I said before, if the primacy falls on Dei Verbum, the Constitution on Revelation, chapter one of Lumen Gentium picks that up, that God has revealed himself and called to himself a people. With the rapid scientific developments and social questions of this century, and a new pope in the Holy See, many wonder if there will soon be a Vatican III. There are more than 5,000 bishops in the Catholic Church today. I mean, where would you put all of these guys? You know, and, and how would they meaningfully take part in a common deliberation uh, that wouldn't be so mind-bogglingly complex that, you know, it would just sort of fall apart? Uh, it, so, you know, I, I think it, whether at, at some point there probably will be another council, but in the meantime, uh, I think what the Church needs is to ponder uh, you know, some, some more postmodern strategies, maybe some virtual strategies, uh, utilizing the communications tools we have these days to promote a greater spirit of collegiality and kind of shared responsibility among the bishops of the world uh, in, in terms of plotting a course for the universal church. Above all, Vatican II stands out in history as a distinctly Christocentric council. I think almost all of the documents uh, have uh, Christ as their center, not merely implicitly, but also explicitly. Uh, the title of the Constitution on the Church is uh, The Light of the Nations, Who is Christ? From the collegiality of bishops in the 1960s to charismatic movements within the Church today, the continuing legacy of Vatican II is all around us. The impact of the Council lives on in parishes, dioceses, religious congregations, families, schools, missions, and the hearts of the faithful across the globe. The Church today still seeks an encounter with all of humanity in the modern world to bring them together under the cross as a people of God, as the body of Christ.